In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has concluded. The Acting Prime Minister on ministerial arrangements. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the Prime Minister will be away today and I will be uh, representing him ably and well. Come on, questions without notice. The member for Sydney. The member for Sydney has the call. The member for Sydney has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer to an FOI request about paid parental leave submitted to the Treasurer's office when he was Social Services Minister. This request was rejected because it would have taken four days to consider the 550 pages of insults which the Treasurer or his colleagues described working women as double dippers, fraudsters, and rorters. Will he now apologise for describing working mums in such abusive and disrespectful terms? Yeah. Treasurer has the call. The Leader of the House, members on my left, the member for Adelaide, the member for Isaacs and the member for Adelaide, the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, the standing orders are pretty straightforward about questioning ministers on their previous roles as a minister which they no longer hold, and as the Treasurer is not responsible anymore for Social Security, uh, then why, how could he be asked that question? The member for Jagger Jagger is warned. The Manager of Opposition Business. I want to hear the Manager of Opposition yeah. Business. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, ministers are asked when an FOI uh, is put forward as to whether or not they're going to release the information. As Treasurer, that request would have gone directly to him. If you prefer the question to be redirected to the Minister for Social Services, that can be done as well. But it is certainly the case that the Treasurer, as Treasurer, has made decisions on exactly this matter. Yes, well, look, the, the question was about the minister's uh, previous portfolio. Uh, I could, on a very strict basis, rule it out of order. Uh, what I will allow, given it's Monday and it's the start of a sitting fortnight, is an opportunity for the member for Sydney to, to rephrase the question. There will be one opportunity. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, I'll redirect the question. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. I refer to a freedom of information request about paid parental leave. Uh, this request was rejected because it would have taken four days to consider the 550 pages of insults in which the Treasurer uh, or his colleagues or his colleagues described working women as double dippers fraudsters and rorters. Uh, will the Social Services Minister apologise on behalf of the government for describing working mums the in such abusive and disrespectful terms? The Minister for Social Services. The Minister has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Uh, those terms that you've raised are not terms that I've ever used with respect to. Uh, with respect to members on my left, with respect to the issue, uh, they're not terms that I've ever heard the treasurer use with respect to that particular issue. It is the case, Mr. Speaker. It is the case, Mr. Speaker, that of course, when you put in a freedom of information request of that nature, it covers indeed any instance where any minister or any member of the executive member has for forwarded. Barton an article written in the press that has used any of the Boolean search terms that you've raised. It doesn't surprise me that a puerile request of that nature has been denied because of the outrageous amount of time that it would take to look through documents to, that include the forwarding of articles written in the media. So it doesn't surprise me that that stunt, it doesn't surprise me that that stunt uh, has been declined uh, by the department through advice because of the amount of time that it would take up. The member for Mallee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister and Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the Acting Prime Minister update the House on the investment that the Commonwealth is making into water infrastructure in the Mallee and around the country? 
Why is it important for hard-working Australians to continue reform that boosts productivity in our economy? The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question, and it was great to get down into the Mallee and to see the work that our nation is doing, and that the, uh, this government is doing in upgrading the water infrastructure. To have a look over the, the new water pumps the, that are lifting water out, a $120 million investment for which we made $103 million of that investment. And to see that the benefit that has for the 2,000 farmers that are going to be getting delivery of that water uh, through the new, the new pipelines that are taking the place of channels. And also to appreciate the seven gigalitres of water that we're putting back into the environment as part of our obligations there. But it's not just there that we are working, it's also in places such as the South West Lodden Pipeline. The South West Lodden Pipeline, the construction of 1,200 kilometres of pipeline to connect West Warangah Channel with the Wimmera Mallee Pipeline. This is making a real difference. This is a government that is actually delivering on water infrastructure, actually building water infrastructure, actually making sure our nation is a stronger place and that we invest in, one of the, rec in the record turnaround we've had in, agricult in agricultural, uh, uh, agricultural exports. The pipe, this pipeline, the Wimmera Mallee Pipeline and the South West Lodden Pipeline, will supply about 780 uh, megalitres of water and will create an extra 130 jobs. I also, Mr. Speaker, went to the Gippsland uh, with, the, the, with, the, with, the, with the member there, with the member for Gippsland, and then there we noted uh, that what we are doing with the Macaulay Irrigation District, our investment there to work hand in glove with the dairy industry, so that we get a better return and a better outcome for those people as well. Mr Speaker, all through this nation we are, we are hearing what the Australian people are saying and they're saying they want the tactile delivery of real infrastructure, real infrastructure that takes our nation forward, real infrastructure such as you would see in the Rookwood Weir, in the member for Capricornia's uh, and member of Capricornia and the member for Flynn's electorate. In those areas too, we know that with the construction of the of Rookwood Weir that we'll see a further in excess of a thousand, jo uh, thousand jobs and um, well, in excess of 2,000 jobs actually, and an extra billion dollars a year in income coming into that district. Coming to that district, this is a this is a story of a government that believes in water infrastructure, a government that's delivering on water infrastructure, a government that put two and a half billion dollars on the table for further construction of water infrastructure. Because we are we are going to make sure that we leave this nation in a better place with a sort with the same vision that we've seen before when they constructed the when they constructed the Stone Mountain scheme. Mr. Speaker, it's one of the is one of the ways that this nation and this government can be clearly identified is that we are a government that believes in building the infrastructure for a stronger future, for a greater future, and we are the government that has turned around our agricultural exports and the returns our nation has got, and we will be the government that delivers a better outcome for all those in regional Australia. The member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting Prime Minister. Under this government's latest cuts to paid parental leave, a woman working at Coles would lose 10 weeks of paid parental leave, a loss of around $6,700. Can the Acting Prime Minister explain to mums working at Coles why he thinks that cutting the amount of time they can spend at home breastfeeding their newborn babies is fair? The Acting Prime Minister. Well, I thank the honourable member for a question. And uh, when I say that we are doing so much in this nation to make sure that we are both fair and we are responsible, that we are fair and responsible, because we acknowledge, we acknowledge that the task that was left to us by a Labor government, a previous Labor government, that left us hundreds of billions of dollars in debt, and every decision that we make, we have to deal with that task. We have to deal with that task, and the Australian people might have forgotten, might have forgotten about the debt. That, that, that the Labor government left for us. But might I remind them Member that when, the, when Mr Howard and Mr yes, Costello yes, left yes. government, the Treasuries were overflowing with money. Overflowing with money. Zero Yet government. through the term of the Rudd Gillard Rudd government, they just squandered it all. They squandered it all, sending our nations hundreds of billions of dollars in debt. And now we're trying to deal with this issue. And I, I, now the, I refer the relevant minister to finish the response. The Minister for Social Services, the member for Ballarat. 
the Minister for Social Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for her question through the Deputy Prime Minister. What might be uh, worth explaining to the individual that you've described is the situation that exists at the very um, other end of the paid parental leave scheme. And of course, at the end that you're talking about, 91 per cent of all of the families that are completely unaffected by what we describe we would do are in the private sector. And yes, uh, there are families often that work in Coles or, or Kmart or, or the like. What might be worth explaining to the person that you've described is why is it fair that that person would be uh, possibly having access to 10 weeks of their own employer scheme and then uh, eight weeks of the government scheme, and yet someone, and yet someone on a median income of $71,000, uh, on a median income of $71,000, on a median or average family income of $147,000. Indeed, a civil servant who might earn $140,000 can get 18 weeks from their employer and an additional 18 weeks through the taxpayer. I might also explain to that person. Uh, I might also say to that person that you, you, Shadow Minister, have said on a number of occasions. You've said on a number of occasions that the median income of the mothers who would be affected by the government's proposed policy here is $43,000, and you've done that deliberately on a number of occasions to scare all of the mothers who Member would absolutely Jagger Jagger. not be affected. So where you have said, where you have said, for instance, in your press release, uh, Member for Jagger Jagger, women who will be worse off on a median income of $43,000, where you've said that on a number of occasions, that is the median income of the mothers who are not affected at all, not affected at all by what we are suggesting. Not only have you unhitched your wagon from the truth, you have taken a fact and deliberately misstated its opposite to try and scare mums into believing they'd be affected when they would not be. Well done. Well done. Just before I call the next question, the members for Sydney, Shortland and Griffith will cease interjecting. The member for Durack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline how an efficient and productive construction sector promotes economic growth and creates jobs for hardworking Australians? What is the government doing to ensure investment in infrastructure and other major projects across Australia is not threatened by lawlessness and dysfunction in the building industry? The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for her question because she knows, representing the great state of Western Australia and a very, very large part of it, just how important efficiency and productivity in the building and construction is, industry is, particularly to the mining and resources sector. Some $114 billion is the value of work done in our non-residential construction and engineering construction industry in Australia, Mr. Speaker. And we know that as a result of the lawlessness in the building and construction industry, which is defended by those opposite, the estimates of the increase in costs on investment, which costs jobs and costs wages, is another 30 per cent on top of that, which drives investment away from this country. And today we know there's some $100 billion of projects, which includes the Wheatstone project, which the member is very familiar with, some $29 billion, the Gorgon project, an $8 billion, the North West Shelf LNG side of $2 billion, all affected by the lawlessness and practices of the unions, which is endorsed and sponsored by those who sit opposite, by refusing to support the Australian and Building and Construction the Commission Treasurer being restored. The member for Morton on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The member for McEwen will cease interjecting. I'm trying to hear the member for Morton. He knows that. He's about two feet from him. The member, uh, for, Mor the member for McEwen will cease interjecting. I'm watching the member for Morton. I'm not looking across the other side of the chamber. If the member for McEwen doesn't wish me to hear the member for Morton, I'll happily move on. The member for Morton. On a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under Rules Section 92A2, I consider it offensive, offensive that he would suggest I support lawlessness on any building site. Now, I'd ask that the, the treasurer veer away from that. The member for Morton has heard members on my right. The member for Mitchell. The member for Morton has heard my rulings on the robust nature of question time before. 
Uh, whilst the member is entitled to make that point of order, if I upheld that, uh, there wouldn't be many questions asked, and I don't think the member for Morton's colleagues would be would be pleased with him. The treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the member for Morton is feeling so aggrieved, they can send back the eleven million dollars that the CFMEU to send to those opposite, Mr. Speaker. That's what they can do if they feel so aggrieved and offended at the suggestion, but by refusing to support the Australian Building and Construction Commission being returned, send back the cash. But they won't, Mr. Speaker. They'll hold on to it. But there is, there was a Labor leader, Mr. Speaker, who understood that there is a line that has to be drawn when we see the sort of offensive behaviour and lawless behaviour that we've seen in the construction sector. And it was indeed the, it was the Prime Minister Hawke, Mr. Speaker, who said this in January of this year. This is what he said: the unions need to clean up their act and get their house in order. It is just appalling. I mean, I wouldn't tolerate it. That's what. Prime Minister Hawke said he said he wouldn't tolerate it. You know what I did with the Builders' Labor's Federation? That's what Mr Hawke said. I'd throw them out. This Leader of the Opposition stands with the lawlessness in the building and construction industry and calls them the side of the angels, Mr Speaker. That's what he does. But an example has been set by former Prime Minister Hawke, which he should follow. But we know he won't because Prime Minister Hawke had the strength which this Leader of the Opposition does not have. He does not have the wit or the stomach to stand up to the union movement, which pulls his chain, Mr Speaker. He's always had his chain pulled by the union movement, and here they are leading him around the policy environment as he refuses to stand up as previous Labor leaders would stand up, but not this one, Mr Speaker. This is a weak leader of the opposition who doesn't have the ticker to be able to address these serious issues. So, no, they won't send the $11 million back. They won't deal with the serious issues of making union officials deal with the same the accountability as company has expired. directors. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting prime minister. Reports today confirm that my IFO will be released on the 19th of December, and the deficit will be up. Why has the treasurer today refused to confirm the government's own budget papers, which show a return to surplus in 2021? And isn't it the case that this government is so chaotic that it would prefer to keep its $50 billion tax cut for big business rather than retain Australia's AAA rating? The acting Prime Minister. Well, I, I, I thank the uh, honourable member for McMahon for his question. And, and, uh, one only has to reflect on what the alternative is. The alternative is a government. Uh, when they talk about chaos, I keep on thinking about pig bats and I think about cash for clunkers. And I think about hundreds of billions of dollars in debt. I think about citizens' assembly. And what was that time when they all sat down on the carpet with a notepad and notepads to try and work out what they were going to do when they actually got into government? When, the, when Prime Minister Rudd sat down to try and send, just send the Conroy full stop. I mean, when we talk about chaos, how could we go past the Australian Labor Party? How good could we go past the whole retinue of madness which otherwise parades as an apparent political party with policy? If you want to talk about chaos, how about this? How does our sister here? They got their backpack attacks, their new backpack attacks from Senator Jackie Lambie. I mean, there's their new chief political adviser. And I'd like to uh, refer to the Treasurer because we have a lot to talk to you about. If you want to know about chaos, chaos on your side to the Treasurer. Thank you, Acting the Prime Minister. And I thank the member for his question to this side of the House. In fact, on, on ABCRN Breakfast on the 13th of May 2010, this is what the uh, member opposite said. He said, the government, that is the then Labor government, has returned the budget to surplus three years ahead of schedule. He actually proclaimed a surplus on the 13th of May 2010, three years ahead of schedule. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what I said on ABC Radio this morning is we'll return to surplus when, when expenditure is less than revenue. That's what I said, Mr. Speaker. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work that out, Mr Speaker, but those opposite to seem to have trouble with this proposition because they were claiming that surpluses have been achieved when revenue was a fraction of expenditure, Mr Speaker. So what we have from those opposite, when you look at their fiscal prescription for the country at a time when ratings agencies are keeping a hawk eye on how things are progressing, their answer is to increase the deficit 
not by just 16.5 billion mr speaker not just by 16.5 billion and getting rid of the company tax cuts for small business and everything else but it's actually now 16.8 billion it's actually gone up mr speaker since the time of the last election so those opposite are wreckers of the nation's finances. The Australian people understand that because they saw them do it for six long years. The member for Melbourne. Thank you, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment and Energy. At the recent Global Climate Summit in Marrakesh, the United States climate envoy said that because of rapid melting in Antarctica, current levels of global warming could see one and a half metres of sea level rise by 2050. In other words, even if the world stopped all pollution tomorrow, by the time a child born today reaches her 30s, she'd live in a world where the sea is one and a half metres higher than now. This isn't a Green Group or climate activist saying this, it's the US government. Minister, given our coastal capital cities, what would be the impacts on Australians' homes, businesses and infrastructure if sea levels rise by one and a half metres? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Melbourne for his question, and I can inform him that this government is taking the challenge of climate change very seriously. And in fact, and in fact, the Foreign Minister and I, the Foreign Minister and I, recently went to Morocco, and we were representing Australia after having ratified the Paris Agreement and our commitment to a 26 to 28 per cent reduction by 2030 on 2005 levels, and on a per capita basis that is one of the highest in the G20. And Australia, Australia was praised for the work it's doing in carbon capture and storage, praised for the work it's doing in innovation, praised for the partnership it's struck with countries like Indonesia to work on deforestation. Unlike those opposite and unlike your party, I say to the member for Melbourne, we are being responsible in our targets. We have one eye on energy security, another on energy affordability, while we're also transitioning to a lower emissions future. Now, it's okay for the member for Melbourne to sip on his latte in the street of Brunswick, to put his sandals up on the seat, to put his sandals up on the seat, the and to say, will resume, Minister will resume and to his say, seat. Minister just resume his seat. Members on my left and right will cease interjecting. Members will cease interjecting. The member for Chifley, the member for Whitlam, the member for Melbourne on a point of order. Point of order on relevant speaker. It wasn't a partisan question about policies. And if the minister the can't tell us about climate impacts on infrastructure, he... the minister has the call. Five and a half billion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Mr Speaker, I was informing the House about how successful we are, not only having met our first Kyoto target and beaten it by 128 million tonnes, how we're on track to beat our 2020 target, but also how we have ambitious 2030 targets. But what I was also pointing out, Mr Speaker, was that it's OK for the member for Melbourne to put his sandals up on the seat, sip his soy latte and sit in the streets of Brunswick and say that it's the end of coal because he put out a press release saying it was the end of coal to celebrate the loss of jobs in the Latrobe Valley for the people of Hazelwood. Shame on him! Shame on him! When he was in the, when he was joining with the Labor Party when they were last in government to pay five and a half billion dollars to those brown coal power stations to keep their doors open. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Mel member for Melbourne doesn't understand that you need a smooth transition and one which is encourages the resources sector and understands that coal is an important part of the energy mix. But if you want to hear a sum up of the, of, about the Greens, you only have to listen to the, for, uh, to the former Prime Minister Paul Keating, who said when he launched the member for Grainler's uh, election campaign, I'll tell you about the Greens. They are a bunch of opportunistic trots hiding behind a gum tree, trying to pretend they are the Labor Party. Mr Speaker, they don't have to pretend they're the Labor Party because the Labor Party has now joined them. The member for Tangney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question, my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry, representing the Minister for Employment. Will the Minister outline to the House any recent examples of activities in registered organisations 
that would be eradicated through the establishment of a registered organisations commission. What is standing in the way of this important reform? The Minister for Defence Industry. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Tangney for his question. And I can tell him that we are introducing a registered organisations commission because Australia needs an honest union movement so that hard-working Australians have a growing, productive economy based on knowing that they have faith and confidence in the honest union leaders that represent them. The evidence that this Registered Organisations Commission is needed is mounting every day. The member for, Morton, member for Tangley might like to know, in fact, that just last Friday, unfortunately, a former secretary of the National Union of Workers, a close friend of one of the members in this House, and a former accounts manager of the National Union of Workers were arrested on 172 fraud charges involving the alleged theft of $870,000 from their hard-working members. 172 fraud charges between two former union leaders of the National Union of Workers, totalling $870,000 of alleged fraud against hard-working Australians, Mr Speaker. And we on this side of the House want to eradicate that kind of practice. The Registered Organisations Commission will help that happen. And who is against it, Mr Speaker? And in fact, some of the expenses that were being used by the, one of these uh, alleged uh, fraudsters would certainly make the, member, the former member of this House, Craig Thompson, blush, Mr. Speaker. And I'll let members, I won't mention them in this House, Mr. Speaker, being a good Catholic boy, but I can tell you, member for members Barker would like to investigate it. It would make Craig Thompson blush. The member for Barker and what's standing is warned. in the way of this, Mr. Speaker? The Leader of the Opposition is what's standing in the way of the Registered Organisations Commission passing the Senate this week. And one has to ask why, Mr. Speaker. Why is the Leader of the Opposition opposed to having a, a commission that ensures we have honest union leaders running honest unions? And it's about judgment, Mr. Speaker. It's about judgment. The Treasurer spoke before earlier about weakness in, in, as opposed to the strength of Bob Hawke. This Leader of the Opposition lacks judgment. He supports union leaders like the CFMEU against hard working Australians. He wants to water down the border protection laws and send messages to the people smugglers to say that we are open to business again. He supports putting Senator Kitching into the Senate when she has been referred to the Commonwealth DPP for investigation and potential prosecution by the Trade Union Royal Commission. Mr. Speaker. He's allowed his shadow ministers to put the US alliance in doubt on so many different subjects, whether it's border protection, national security, trade union reforms. This Leader of the Opposition shows that he's not up to the job. He lacks the judgment to be Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Speaker, unless he changes his mind about the Registered Organisations Commission the bill. The Minister's time has expired. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. If the government drops its plan for a big business tax cut, which costs the budget $50 billion, Will it be more or less likely that the budget will be in balance in 2021? The Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I don't intend to engage in the hypotheticals of the member opposite. The mid-year statement will come out on the 19th of December, and that will take account of all the various other uh, data sets that will be available at that time, and, and the member opposite will be in a position uh, to observe what the outcomes are at that point. But I do know that back in 2013, he looked to his mentor and he said this, Keating knew that the corporate tax rate needed to be cut to make Australia competitive, that capital and investment would flow to tax competitive nations and that this was an important job creation move. Now that's what the member opposite said, Mr Speaker. Today he has walked away, as he has now for many months, from the deep convictions that he once held about the importance of having a competitive tax rate, not just for all businesses, Mr. Speaker, but in small businesses as well. Small businesses, a business of a two and a half million turnover employing 15 people. The shadow treasurer thinks that sort of a business should have a higher tax burden than what the government is proposing. 
but he asks about what the impact on the budget would be if we were to follow the path of those opposite, which would seek to impose higher taxes on small businesses. Well, I ask him, Mr Speaker, what does he think the impact on the budget is going to be if they continue in their approach of blocking $19 billion in budget savings measures? Yes, Mr Speaker, they got dragged kicking and screaming to support $6 billion in measures that they actually put in their own estimates before the budget. But $19 billion, and that's just over four years. No wonder, Mr Speaker, they took to the last election an increase in deficit of $16.5 billion that has now increased to $16.8 billion, Mr Speaker. So if those opposite are deadly serious about dealing with issues on the fiscal scene, Mr Speaker, they need to get serious about passing the savings which the rating agencies have made very clear, as the IMF has made very clear and others have made very clear, Mr Speaker, that these measures need to be passed to ensure that Australia's fiscal position is as resilient and as strong as it can be. And the only party standing in the way of that, Mr Speaker, are those opposite. Those opposite who want to continue to run up the expenditure, run up taxes, run up debt, run up deficits. They learnt nothing from their six wasted years in office, and they learnt nothing from the four years now of their wasted time in a policy deficit in opposition. Just before I call the member for Ford, I inform the House that we've just had join us in the chamber this afternoon a delegation of ASEAN parliamentarians. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. Will the minister outline how Australians working in the tourism sector will benefit from the 2018 Commonwealth Games? And what support has the Commonwealth Gov Coalition government given to the 2018 Commonwealth Games? And is the minister aware of any risks to the timely completion of games infrastructure? The Minister for Trade and Investment and Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I thank the member for Ford for his question. I know that he's uh, personally, like the other Gold Coast members, very excited about the upcoming 2018 Commonwealth Games. Uh, and in fact, yesterday marked 500 days until the Gold Coast hosts the 2018 Games. Uh, it will be, Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the biggest sporting events in Australia this decade, uh, and the largest that's ever been hosted by the Gold Coast. In fact, the coalition recognises the significant benefits that will be associated with hosting 6,600 athletes from 71 nations in front of some 1.5 million spectators and an estimated television audience of around 1.5 billion people. Uh, the Games will attract more than 100,000 visitors to the Gold Coast and generate an estimated economic boost of some $2 billion, as well as leaving a legacy of good quality sports and other infrastructure for the city. That's part of the reason why the coalition government has invested $156 million in the Commonwealth Games, and I was pleased we were also able to secure an extra $15 million for the redevelopment of the Metricon Stadium precinct, including the facilities for the Gold Coast Suns. But I note the member for Ford also asked about risks to the timely completion of the Commonwealth Games infrastructure. <coughs> and I've got to say, Mr Speaker, unfortunately, yes, there are risks that the infrastructure will not be completed in time for the Commonwealth Games. You see, the unlawful activities of good friends of the Australian Labor Party, the unions, in particular the militant and extreme CFMEU, are providing a direct risk to the successful completion of Games infrastructure and indeed of the Games Village for the athletes themselves. For months, we have witnessed the CFMEU deliberately causing delays, threatening safety officers and blowing out costs for the Commonwealth Games infrastructure. And indeed, Mr Speaker, only last week we saw reports of sabotage on the Commonwealth Games village at Parklands. And we saw the CFMEU, no doubt being very good-natured, uh, lodge yet another complaint about the Parklands site, claiming concerns over safety. Now, what we saw reported, though, Mr. Speaker, was that there were a large number of pens used to go and support the actual scaffolding around sites themselves that mysteriously vanished. And the CFMEU officials claim that this had nothing to do with them and had nothing to do with Crocon, even though, quite strangely, Mr. Speaker, 
even though, quite strangely, it just so happens that the militant and extreme CFMEU are in dispute with Grocon over an EBA. That's the reason why the Labor Party and this seat of the opposition can simply not be trusted to make decisions in Australia's national interest because they're not the putting Australia first, they're about putting expired. unions first. The member for Sydney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. The National Party Education Minister in New South Wales, Adrian Piccoli, said about Labor's plan for extra schools funding, and I quote, the Nationals supported the reforms right from the start. It's good policy that really benefits country schools and country kids. We don't play politics with our children's future. Does the Acting Prime Minister agree with his Nationals colleague, Adrian Piccoli, or will he continue to make excuses for the government's policies of cuts that will see every country kid in every country school worse off? The Minister for Infrastructure will cease interjecting. The Acting the Prime Minister has well, called. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Sydney for a question. And might I say that not only are we putting more money into education than they ever did, but each year we put in more money than we did the previous year. So what we are the member for seeing Sydney here, what we is are quite, warned. quite clearly seeing is that the, the Labor Party have an interest, have a, a direct interest in this, and their interest is with the Teachers' Federation. Their interest is with the Teachers' Federation to make sure that one of their champions who hand out for them at every polling booth that has, has have no, nothing in mind except to get rid of a coalition government continues to be supported. But I can say that it is, since about 1988 there has been a doubling in real terms, in real terms, in the education funding of our students in this nation. But one of the things we're dealing with, unfortunately, especially under the Labor governments, is that our levels, our PISA levels, against our other, our other trading partners have been falling. Have been falling. And what we can also acknowledge is that, that the Labor Party has this vendetta, almost a vendetta against independent schools, a vendetta against Catholic schools, a vendetta against anybody but the people in the, in the public school region. And we say that it is a person's choice. It is a person's choice where they send their kids, and we want to support that choice. It's one of the clear differentiations between our side of the House and their side of the House. Our belief not only in a strong public school network, but also in a strong private and independent school network. A belief in people's choices. A belief in the Catholic school system. A belief in the independent school system. A belief in the Lutheran school system. And what we get, what we always get from the Labor Party, always is the, the diatribe that's punched out by the Teachers' Federation because that's their union mates helping them out. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. If there's, one, if there's one group of people who are always looking after regional Australia, it would be the National Party and our, Liberal pa and, our, and our country Liberal friends. And our country Liberal friends. Our country Liberal friends. Because we actually believe in actually living there. We actually have seats there. We actually represent the people there. And, that, and of course, uh, of course, whenever you try to go to the Labor Member Party Sydney, and talk about final uh, a greater investment in regional areas by decentralisation, by moving people out, who fights against us? Well, it's the Australian Labor Party. Any excuse at all just to keep them poor. That's how the Labor Party thinks. Any excuse at all just to keep them poor. So we are proud of the work that we are doing in education. We stand by the fact that we have greater funding, but we are not going to follow the dictums of the Teachers' Federation of Australia. We will make sure we look after the needs and the aspirations of the students. The member for Barton is warned, and the member for Robertson has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. Will the minister advise the House why it is important to maintain the rule of law in Australian industry? How will the government's ABCC and Registered Organisations Commission boost Australian investment and support jobs for hard-working Australians? Yeah. Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the member for Robertson, who has a great interest in uh, construction, in industry and in development, and as somebody in particular who has overseen the plans, the pledge, the promise, and will oversee the delivery of the Gosford Medical School. And that's why she con is concerned about real-world delivery of construction projects and a timely delivery of construction projects. Now, the construction sector in Australia employs a million people. It represents 9 per cent 
of the workforce. It represents 8 per cent of GDP, but it could be stronger still if there were less disruptions and therefore more projects commenced and therefore more jobs created. Construction, industry, jobs that could be created which aren't, be, uh, aren't being created now. We saw today, of course, that these disruptions are now up to affecting over $100 billion of projects in the work that is being done by the CFMEU. And you say, well, that's ex an extremely large number, and the Treasurer has gone through a series of the projects. But let's take this down to the level of the sorts of projects that are being affected. We know in Victoria that prisons are being dismayed. Oh, uh, uh, prisons are being deferred by the CFMEU. I can understand why. But so are hospitals. So are hospitals. We have the Queensland Children's Hospital, which is being disrupted. The Royal Adelaide Hospital, where Jimmy O'Connor, it's a big family, uh, was part of a finding of the court which delivered a $100,000 fine against CFMEU members where he pledged to go to war, pledged to go to war uh, in relation to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, the Fleury Institute, the Kuringai Hospital in New South Wales, the Perth Children's Hospital. All of these, all of these have been subject to CFMEU disputes which they are opposing any action on when they oppose the ABCC legislation and the ROC legislation. You ask, why would they do that? Why would they oppose action to clean up our hospitals? And what is it that we've seen? The, we've seen the minister a story knows here. the rule on props. I'm just reading. Uh, we've seen a story I'm here on the watching. front page of the Courier Mail, which begins, who's really the boss? Like Bill it. Shorten secured the leadership of the, AF, uh, the ALP with the help of a secret backroom deal with the CFMEU to vote down the construction watchdog. So what he's doing is trading the jobs of blue-collar workers for his own jobs. He's not the friend of the worker, he's the puppet of the union leaders, and he's trading in the very people he pretends the to represent. I'm happy to table that. The member for Hunter. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can he confirm that he doctored his Hansard, forced out the Department Mental Secretary who dared to, to question his integrity, announced the relocation of the APVMA to his own electorate without releasing the cost-benefit analysis, analysis, and free, is free-ranging against his colleagues on the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, contrary to his Prime Minister? Does the Acting Prime Minister agree? That with this trail of chaos and division in his wake, he's looking more like the Liberal Prime Minister every day. Yeah. <laughs> the acting Prime Minister has the call. I just don't know what to say. It's the it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's like being lectured. It's like having the drunk lecturer at the Temperance League. It's the most. It's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing. Let's try and go through. You. Let's try and go through the member for Hunter's allegations in seriatim. Number one, I never doctored the Hansard. I never doctored the Hansard, and that this has been dealt with over and over and over again. It's like the only feather you've got to fly with, and even that's fallen out years ago. And yet, there you are, sort of strung up, strung up by a featherless wing. Uh, the other one, uh, do we want to move APVMA? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We believe in decentralisation on this side of the house. We believe not only moving APVMA to Armadale, but moving Reddick to Wagga, moving GRDC to Toowoomba. Yes, we believe in decentralisation. We believe in moving Member the Fisheries Canberra. Research Development Corporation to Adelaide. We believe in the large yes of our nation being spread more evenly across. And of course, what you believe in, what you believe in, is just Member keeping it all in one little interjecting. box. One little bo one little spot, and of course, um, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I acknowledge that we have a vision for this nation. We have a vision. We are proud of the turnaround we've seen in agricultural exports. We're proud that we are getting a better return through the farm gate. We're proud of the fact that when we speak to the pork producers, they're getting record returns. When we speak to the sugar producers, they're getting record returns. When we speak to the cattle producers, they're getting record returns. When we speak to the meat sheep producers, we're getting record returns. We're proud of the work we do. We're proud of the results we get. We're proud of the fact that we believe in dams and that we're driving those that we're driving a dams project ahead. 
and we admonish we admonish the Labor Party for the fact that if they ever got into government, they would take away dam funding. They would take away the funding for dams because they have no vision. They are visionless. They are a philosophers' club. That is all they are. And of course, the other thing we acknowledge is we acknowledge that it is great. It is great that they have let. They have let the member for Hunter off the leash for, for a Hunter. second question in a year <laughs> the member on a policy issue. So that's good. And we, we always think we always think we have we worry about you in our question time preparation, the member for Hunter. We worry about you. We know how it goes. You'd wander down, you'd see the member for Watson, and you'd say, Please, can I have a question today? Please, may I have a question today? And he'd reply to you something similar to what uh, Mr Hunter down in South Australia replied to me. Something similar and how he replied to me. That sort of colourful vindic, colourful invective. And I, but today's your day. Today's your day. And I'd like to acknowledge the fact that he has managed to get above question 13. He has got above question 13. So you're having a good day in the office. So you should want to see more of me. You should want to see more of me because it's the only hope you've got. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the importance of a strong economy to improve the budget and arrest Australia's debt? How does promoting investment in the Australian economy boost revenue to, to the budget and lift wages for hardworking Australians? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for Boothby for her question. I was in South Australia recently and spoke to many South Australian businesses who are looking forward to the introduction of the reduced uh, company tax rate, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses, because they understand in the environment where we need Australians to be able to gain more working hours, to improve their wages and to improve their earnings, then we need businesses to be in a position to enable them to do that. Yeah. Now, those opposite want to keep businesses on higher rates of tax. How they think that's going to enable a business to give employees more hours of work is beyond me, Mr Speaker. But we know those opposite, when it comes to tax, they can never get enough. And every time they see an estimate which shows some pressures on revenues, what they think they need to do is just keep, keep squeezing that tax lemon as hard as they possibly can. But we know on this side that we need to be able to support small business and medium-sized business in particular to ensure that they can give those employees who work in those businesses the opportunities. Now, it's not just the coalition who believes that. In fact, at a time past, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker, used to believe in these sorts of things. At the ACOS event in March of 2011, at a time when those opposite had a $47 billion deficit, this is what he said. He said, reducing the corporate tax rate sees more capital flowing into our domestic economy, which will then flow onto workers in the form of higher wages, thereby improving standards of living. And because reducing the company tax rate is an economic growth instrument, reducing the corporate tax rate is also an investment in the Australian people, including people who might now be on welfare and require the services of ACOS members. He said it frees up more capital for business to invest in skills and training and apprenticeships and mentoring. This makes reducing the rate reducing the rate a productivity improver, he said, given it's more capital available per person in the company's workforce and more capital available for potential investment in research and development. He summed up, he said to ACOS friends, corporate tax reform helps Australia's private sector grow and it creates jobs right up and down the income ladder. What hypocrisy now, Mr Speaker, from the Leader of the Opposition who said that to an ACOS audience, knowing full well that giving companies the opportunity to give people more, more work and better wages, he now walks away from it. He claims it's to protect the budget, yet they refuse to support $19 billion in savings and at the same time having cashed in, cashed in, sorry, cashed out, taking away the corporate tax cut, they still have a deficit which is $16.8 billion higher. Mr Speaker, this Leader of the Opposition believes in nothing, stands for nothing. If he were ever have the opportunity the to run Treasurer's a budget, he'd run it into expired. the ground. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Yesterday, when speaking about the Acting Prime Minister's plan to dismantle the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, Senator Xenophon said, and I quote, 
Barnaby was free-ranging the other day. It doesn't reflect whole of government policy. Is the acting Prime Minister aware who in the government communicated this message to Senator Xenophon? And was the Senator correct? Was it fair to describe the acting Prime Minister as free-ranging? The acting Prime Minister well, um, has the call. Mr Speaker, I, I thank the uh, honourable member for Maribyrnong for his question. And, uh, obviously, it has an, agri an agricultural slant with his uh, reference to free-ranging. But um, I'd just like to quote to him. I'd like to quote to him the legislation, the legislation as uh, actually written by your member for Watson. And um, yeah, have a drink of water and have a listen to this. Um, the efficiency contributions—that's what the 450 gigalitres is about—to be proposed adjustments achieve, have to achieve. Listen neutral or improved socio-economic outcomes. Neutral or improved. Now, the person who wrote that is just sitting behind you. He's a member for Watson, right? And so what we're actually talking about is what's in the plan. It's actually the reality, actually the reality of the plan. And what we are trying to do, what we are trying to do is work our way through this maze that's been set by you. And in working our way through this maze to finalise the plan, uh, we have to have negotiations, civil negotiations, civil negotiations. Um, now, Mr. Speaker, we had a crack at these civil negotiations, um, and uh, we went down. We met a rather interesting, interesting chap, Mr. Hunter, um, and he had a few things to say, most of them old Saxon terms. Um, and we tried, we tried to actually continue on the discussion. But after he sort of filled the room with blue uh, and got stuck into actually one of your colleagues, one of your colleagues, um, he then slammed the door. He had a couple of guys that slammed the door because it didn't quite get it the first time, and then, and then proceeded out into a public restaurant, into a public restaurant where he continued his profanities till he made it to the door and started eating an ice cream. Now, if that is what we call Labor Party negotiations, the Labor Party dealing with a the problem, then I think somebody has something to answer for. And might I remind you, the member for Maribyrnong, is this: is you have made statements about what you believe is appropriate and inappropriate, but you have been remarkably silent since this has been occupying every paper in the nation. Remarkably silent. We have not heard boo from you, not boo from you, about what your views are on the how, how a senior minister would treat other people's staff and just people of the public in general. Why on earth are you not saying something about this? Or is it a case that the member for Maribyrnong, the leader of the opposition, is one thing on one day when he's in front of uh, I don't know, Fran Kelly and something entirely different, entirely different when it's one of his colleagues? So we will continue to work as hard as we can. We have invested billions upon billions of dollars in making sure that we finalise the plan. We are working towards it. We are making sure that we do everything we can to maintain that socio and economic balance in equivalence with the environment so that we can actually provide the outcome. And we would appreciate it. Appreciate it. Our humble, my humble request is that when we go to South Australia to actually talk to the Labor Party minister, that he stays for more than like uh, 10 minutes in the meeting before he fills the room with profanities and charges down the, the street to eat on ice cream. The Prime Minister's time has expired. Just before I call the member for Petrie, could I inform members of the House that we have present with us in the Speaker's Gallery this afternoon, former member for MacArthur, Mr Pat Farmer. Uh, welcome back. The member for Petrie. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the Minister please update the House on the importance of maintaining a consistent approach to safeguard Australia's national security? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Petrie for his question. As he well knows, under the coalition government, Australia's reputation has been reinforced as a strong and reliable partner and ally in terms of our strategic and defence contribution to security challenges in our region and globally. We can be relied upon to support others, we're dependable, most importantly we're consistent in our approach to security issues, including border protection and defence. Mr Speaker, we are prepared to advocate, to defend and to fight for our national interest while building stronger relationships with other nations and partners to strive for increased peace and security. A key to our global and regional standing has been the consistency in our approach. Other nations are clear about our values and for what and where we stand. 
The contrast with the opposition could not be greater. Under this weak leader of the opposition, Labor's border protection policy is all over the place. It often depends on the time of the day as they lurch from position to position. And it's clear that the leader of the opposition has learned nothing from the catastrophic border protection failures when they were in government. Not content with undermining our national security on that front, the opposition has now proposed a downgrade to our security alliance with the United States. But once again, they are all over the shop, sometimes contradicting themselves within the same interview or speech. It reminds me of Labor's position on the South China Sea. They have five positions. Well, they've got four stated positions and a no position from the Leader of the Opposition. That makes five. Mr Speaker, it is instructive when, under pressure, the Opposition declares its bipartisan support for the US alliance, but then a crab walks away from the alliance by saying it's at a change point, knowing full well that this kind of rhetoric from the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate taps into that very rich vein of anti-American sentiment in the Labor left as it seeks to ever more align itself with the Greens on national security. The trend is clear. The trend is clear. The Leader of the Opposition describing the President-elect of the United States as barking mad, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate calling for a downgrade to the ANZUS alliance. The Leader of the Opposition is quite prepared to put our security alliance with the United States at risk for some cheap domestic political points at home. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the House described the lack of judgment. Well, combined the lack of judgment with his weakness, the Leader of the Opposition is a threat to Australia's national security. Whether it's border protection, whether it's our alliances, Labor cannot be trusted on national security. No aspect of our national security. Yeah, yeah. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer to the Acting Prime Minister's previous answer. Given the 450 additional gigalitres is to be acquired through investment in on-farm infrastructure, how can it be possible for there to be negative consequences for communities caused by taxpayers paying for farmers to improve their infrastructure? Isn't it the case that the National Party is simply looking for any excuse while the Prime Minister is away to tear apart the bipartisan consensus on the Murray-Darling? The Acting Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, this is a very special day. It's a very special day now on two accounts. One is that uh, I'm, I'm the act well, that's, uh, well I, reckon, I reckon I'll be over here longer than ever you will be. But, but the, other one, the other one is this. That is the first question, the first question I've ever got on water. The first question from the Labor. That is how much concern Member they have for Gordon is So it's a special day. Note it in your diary. The 21st of November, in the year of our Lord, 2016. Member the Labor Party Marsh. decided to ask me a question about water, and oh, and I welcome it. And I welcome it. It might be that we were doing such a good job. There was nothing worth asking a question about. They might have thought it was a strategic weakness. But I, but I thank, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for asking me this question, because. Well, amongst other things, amongst other things, on the average price, on the average price, because we got uh, 1.77 billion dollars in the account. If you take the 200 million out for works and measures, that's uh, 1.57. And for 1.57 billion, you haven't got a hope in Hades of, of delivering 450 gigs. Not a hope. Are you suggesting? Are you suggesting? Are you suggesting? And you might want to talk to the member for McMahon that you're going to put more money on the table. If you are, I welcome it. I look at the member for McMahon. He's got his arms folded. He's not saying boo. He's not saying. He's not saying a thing. He's not saying a thing. And what we got, what we got from in the br in the brief amount of time that the respective minister or the, the person who is supposed to be the minister in South Australia was apparently that the Commonwealth would just fork out, would just fork out and pay for it. Whatever it required, we'd just find the money. We never actually find out where they're going to find the money from, and this is the issue. This is the complexities that we're trying to deal with. And I say once more, we would appreciate it that if we take the effort, if we actually make the call to South Australia, write the letter to South Australia, go to South Australia, have the meeting in South Australia, that the minister from South Australia manages to stay there for more than 10 to 15 minutes before tearing out the door. I mean, we are trying to make sure that we land the plan and have things work out. because. 
Uh, and I acknowledge it. The first iteration with, under the Labor Party, and you did a good job in the second, but the first iteration, it was a complete and utter disaster. We were on the edge of, of almost civil disturbance. Civil disturbance. So it is a highly contentious issue. And we are doing everything in our power to make sure that we get this thing through. But uh, we are going to require a bit more diligence and a lot more courtesy than we're currently getting from the Australian Labor Party. The member for Latrobe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister update the House on further steps the government has taken to facilitate third country resettlement of refugees on Nauru and Manus Island? How does this demonstrate this government's commitment to protecting Australia's borders? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for his question. Commend him on the work he's doing at the moment uh, in Victoria, staring down the apex gangs and the threat uh, that those people are posing to people in Victoria. A job that Daniel Andrews is not doing, and it is actually quite shameful. But it's reflective of the weakness of the modern-day Labor leadership that they can't stand up to unlawful elements in our society. Now. Mr Speaker, the reality is that we were charged at the last election with cleaning up one of the significant public policy failings since Federation. That is the 50,000 yeah, 50, people that arrived on 800 boats and 1,200 people drowned at sea. We were charged, Mr Speaker, with cleaning that mess up. We said to the Australian people that we would resolve this issue of Labor's making we said that we would get children out of detention, and we have. We said that we would close detention centres. We've closed 17 detention centres that Labor opened. We said that we would get people off Manus and Nauru. We are in the process of doing that, and that's why we announced only in the last week or so the arrangement with the United States. But what is very important, Mr Speaker, what is very important is that people smugglers in Indonesia in Sri Lanka, in Vietnam and elsewhere at the moment, hear a very strong and consistent message, not only from the Prime Minister but from the alternative Prime Minister of this country. Because Australians are watching now and looking at this government cleaning up a mess of Labor's making. Labor put those people onto Manus and Nauru. Labor put those kids into detention. And Labor created a policy which saw those people drown at sea. We've cleaned Labor's mess up. But in trying to get people off Manus and Nauru, we are concerned. We are concerned, and I've been very open about this, about people smuggling, people smuggling syndicates, putting together propaganda and messages to try and get people onto boats. But the Australian people are watching in bewilderment at the leader of the opposition's actions right now, because he is weak. He is incapable of showing leadership. The, le the legislation we have passed before this House, which is now in the Senate, faces defeat because the Labor Party cannot deal with the left of their own party. And this weak leader of the opposition will stand up at the next election and somehow try and convince Australians that he has the same resolve as this Prime Minister and this government to stare down the continuing threat from people smugglers. And all I say to the Australian people is don't look at what this leader of the opposition says, but look at what he does. He says he's on a unity ticket with us when it comes to stopping boats. And he does the complete opposite, and he fails every test. He is the great chameleon of Australian politics, and he shows yet again the he's unfit to be prime minister of this country. Has expired. The leader of the opposition has the call. Thank you. My question is to the minister for immigration. Last week, when speaking about his immigration portfolio, the minister for immigration said, and I quote: "The reality is Malcolm Fraser did make mistakes in bringing some people in the 1970s." Which people was the minister referring to? And will the minister now apologise to Australia's hard-working migrant communities, including but not limited to the Vietnamese community? Yeah. The Minister for Immigration and Well, Border Mr Speaker, I'm not going to be misrepresented by this great fraud of Australian politics. I can assure you of that. I'm not going to be bullied by this union leader. That may have been his working life. He may have bullied people and he may have double-crossed everybody he's come across in his working life, but I won't be bullied and I won't be demonised by this, by this union leader. Now, Mr Speaker, I made the point last week 
I made the point last week that we do have concerns about elements within the Australian society at the moment, in particular some of those people who have been involved in criminal activity, some of those people who have been involved in heading off to Syria and to Iraq. And I'm not going to allow the rest of the community, the rest of the community in Sydney and Melbourne in particular, to be defined by those small elements who are doing, who are besmirching the vast majority of people within their own communities. I'm not going to allow that to happen. But the at the same minister, time, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell, you what, seats, I'll tell you what. The minister will resume his seat. The member for Lindsay and, and the member for Parramatta will leave under 94A. The minister has the call. The member for Lindsay and the member for Parramatta. The minister has the call. So, Mr. Speaker, where I see extremism, I will call it out. Where I see people, where I see people, where I see people breaking the Australian law, I will call it out. And where I see people doing harm to Australians, I will call it out. And I'll tell you what else I'll call out, Mr. Speaker. That is this weak leader of the opposition. You can't pretend to be the alternative prime minister of the this country, but not have the result. To has the minister concluded his answer? The minister's concluded his answer. The members on my left. The member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Personnel. Will the minister advise the House what the impact of a change in the Australian-US relationship would have on Australia's Defence Force personnel? Great question. The Minister for Defence Personnel. The member for Greenland and the Minister for Immigration will cease their exchange. The Minister for Defence Personnel has the call. I'd like to thank the member for her question and note her commitment to the defence community in her electorate of Capricornia. The member for Capricornia knows the value of having local communities involved in joint exercises between Australian and US forces. Her electorate plays host to the exercise Talisman Sabre at the Shoalwater Bay military training area and would also be the beneficiary of $2 billion in investment from joint Australian-Singaporean exercises. Mr Speaker, any change in the Australian-US relationship puts at risk the unique capabilities that to benefit Australian Defence Force personnel. For example, the Force Posture Agreement, which will see up to 2,500 US Marines rotate through the Northern Territory, is a key enabler of our future security in the Northern Territory. The Force Posture Agreement was signed in 2014 and came into force in 2015. Australia and the US will share the cost for more than $2 billion in infrastructure investment in Northern Australia, as well as the ongoing costs of the initiative over the 25-year life of the agreement. This initiative is bringing a large amount of money into the Territory. It not only provides training for ADF personnel, but stimulates the local economy. The member for Lingiari understands this. When US Marines first started exercises in the Northern Territory, he said, we have unique attributes which can now be shared in a more formal way with our comrades from the United States. And it's a very important part that we are playing as a community in that relationship, and we should be very proud of it. Yet it seems the shadow foreign minister underestimates the extraordinary benefit of these links and the importance of our current relationship with the US. As the Minister of Foreign Affairs noted, she wants to sadly downgrade our relationship with the US. The local member for Lingiari is right to point out how important that relationship is. But what we want to know is what does the Leader of the Opposition think? The Leader of the Opposition has a problem. The Leader of the Opposition has a problem. His side of politics is divided when it comes to the most important alliance relationship we have. We need to know from the Leader of the Opposition whose side is he taking. Is he backing his shadow foreign affairs minister or is he backing sensible people like the member for Lingiari? It's time the Leader of the Opposition owned up to his problem and the told us where he stands. The Minister's time has expired. The Leader of the House. 
Oh, sorry, the uh, leader of the opposition. <laughs> I was thinking about something the leader of the house had just said. It's okay. uh, leader of the opposition has the call. Uh, um, my question is to the Minister for Immigration. I refer to his previous answer. Minister, which people from which country does the minister believe should not have been allowed into Australia when Mr Fraser was Prime Minister? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Well, Mr. Speaker, the I member for uh, Isaacs is warned. I thank the Leader of the Opposition uh, for his question. The advice that I have is that out of the last 33 people who have been charged with terrorist-related offences in this country, 22 of those people are from second and third generation Lebanese Muslim background. Now, I'm not going to allow I'm not going to allow people who are hard working, who have done the right thing Manager by this country, business. who have contributed, who have worked hard, who have educated their children. I'm not going to allow those people to be defined by those people who are doing the wrong thing and have been charged with terrorist offences or have been involved in crime otherwise. And if the leader of the opposition wants somehow to conduct a phony debate in this country and not to be honest uh, in relation to these matters. Well, that is an issue for the him. Manager now, of we are doing business. all that we can through our intelligence agencies and through our border protection agencies uh, to make sure that we detect offences before they occur, to make sure that, in particular, we can disrupt uh, these terrorist offences in particular before they take place. But I'm not going to shy away from the facts. And I, I, I hold up those people who have come from all walks of life, uh, the Vietnamese who came in, people who have come in from Asia, from war-torn Europe, people who have come in from Lebanon and otherwise, many people who have built this country over many decades deserve to be praised. They deserve to be praised, but I am going to call out those people who are doing the wrong thing. And if we pretend otherwise, Mr Speaker, my judgment is that we only compound these problems. Now, it is very hard to take anything serious from this Leader of the Opposition when he presided over the greatest failing of public policy in this country's history when they allowed the 50,000 people on 800 boats to come into this country. We are getting the balance right when it comes to the migration policy in this country. We have 18,750 people a year coming here under our refugee and humanitarian programs. We have a net migration figure of close to 200,000, and we are working on one of the best programs in the world to provide a second start in life for people, and we want them to do it in a safe society. I don't want people, whether they are long-standing or new arrivals to our country, I don't want those people being harmed. I don't want terrorist offences being committed in our country. I don't want people committing uh, all sorts of extortion and other crimes in parts of the country. I don't want that. I want a safe country. And I'm going to do everything that I can, Mr Speaker, in this portfolio to stare these threats down. I'm not interested in the politically correct nonsense that the Leader of the Opposition might carry on with. I want to make sure that we settle people in this country who want to take the opportunity given to them. We provide support services, education, housing, and many people, the vast majority of people, make an absolute go of that. But those people who don't, we should own up to our mistakes, we should rectify the problems, and we should ensure the great future of this country. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can the tre my question is uh, constituency question is to the treasurer. Can the treasurer outline how the government is working to promote jobs uh, for Australian workers in areas of high un youth unemployment, such as Leichhardt, which is one of the highest youth unemployment rates in the country at more than 27 per cent? Can the treasurer advise of any alternative plans which puts foreign workers as a competitive advantage uh, in the Australian labour market? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I, I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question. He knows what it's like to get a job when he's young and doing whatever job he can get himself into to start life. He, his first job, he tells me, was cleaning the bathrooms at the local train station as a 15-year-old, Mr Speaker. And we know that Australians across this country want to work. They want to work more, and we know that young people want to be in jobs, and they want to go and get those jobs, Mr. Speaker. That's why, in the budget this year, we announced our $850 million youth employment path program, which will get underway next year, which is about getting longer-term young unemployed people into work, where they can choose a future which is completely different to being dependent on a life of welfare. But they need the opportunities, Mr. Speaker, particularly in regional areas, and that's why it comes at some great surprise to me that while the leader of the 
the opposition goes around beating its chest about how much he wants to support Australian workers, but at the same time wants to offer a big fat tax cut to foreign workers, Mr Speaker. People coming on 417 visas. He wants to cut their tax from 32.5 cents all the way down to 10.5 cents, Mr Speaker. Now, on this side of the House, we have put forward a sensible, practical for proposal—19 cents in the dollar, which ensures that backpackers who come to Australia take home and put in their pocket what they'd get if they were working in Canada or New Zealand or the United Kingdom. Not good enough for this mob. Not good enough for this mob. They want to give foreign workers a tax advantage to go and pick fruit over young Australians. Who could go and do that work, Mr. Speaker? They want to incentivise employers in regional Australia by giving foreign workers a tax cut and for them to pay less tax than an Australian would in the same circumstances, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to foreign workers, we've had the Leader of the Opposition beating his chest about 457s, but he was the gold medal standard in issuing 457s when he was responsible, Mr. Speaker. This is the party of Mr. McTiernan, who was on a 457 when he worked for Julia Gillard, for goodness sake, Mr. Speaker. Apparently, there weren't enough. Um, media professionals in this country who could provide the former government with media advice. We had to get someone out on a 457, Mr Speaker. And then there are the unions who were employing 457 workers hand over a fist, which was exposed by the Minister for Employment. This Leader of the Opposition, when it comes to talking about us supporting Australian workers, you need to look no further than the big fat tax cut he wants to ensure foreign workers get by reducing their tax rate from 32.5 cents all the way down to 10.5 cents. Now, this issue needs to be resolved, Mr Speaker, and I am confident that we'll be able to come to an arrangement with those in the other place, Mr Speaker, who are keen to see this issue resolved. But what those opposite have done is do nothing more than their usual cynical playing of politics with the jobs of young Australians. The Acting Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, after a delightfully entertaining day, and although I'd like to go on and on and on, I've asked that further questions be put on the notice paper. I thank the Acting Prime Minister. If I could just have members' attention, I just wanted to inform members of the recent death of Mr Bernie Harris. Bernie retired in 2002, having been the Chief Hansard reporter. Uh, he worked in the parliament for 38 years, all of those with Hansard. He dedicated his career and his work to this parliament and took an active interest in parliamentary matters after his retirement. I extend on behalf of the House our sympathy to his family and friends and wanted to just pass on the news to, to members. Yeah.